Hi guys, welcome back. This is episode 115, featuring the first part of my interview with Chris Taylor, the founder of Gas Powered Games, creator of Dungeon Siege, Total Annihilation, and much more. In this first segment, we talk about Chris's early days, how he learned to program, and the very first projects he was involved with. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Taylor. All right, folks, I am here with Chris Taylor. He's a veteran with over 20 years experience in the industry. He's the founder and CEO of Gas Powered Games. He's the creator of Dungeon Siege, uh, one of my favorite action RPGs, a Total Annihilation Supreme Commander. <laughs> it's good to have you here, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and, uh, on, it's, and it looks like we've both got actual nice weather. So we've got it's it's a it's a it's a wonderful time, in to be uh, to be inside. No, not at all. <laughs> now, I I was reading on a, an interview you did on Gama Sutra that mentioned that you have a farm. Is that a, is that a joke or do you actually have a farm? Well, um, we have an acre and a half, uh, and you know you can do nothing with your acre and a half. Uh, my wife loves to have. Uh, she's got some gardens, and uh, we had we had a horse. That, that came with the house. The people we bought the house from said, um, you know, we have this horse. Uh, the horse can't go with us. We can't take it to our to our new place. Would you like it? And we said, well, why not? Um, so we ended up with a horse. And then we got some dogs. And my wife said, oh, I'd love chickens. So I built a chicken coop for her. That's in the Kings and Castles video blog um, scene. I built the chicken coop and, and, and most of the structures that are in that video and uh, then we uh, we added geese, um, and then we have sheep, um, and uh, we have a, a koi pond, you know, with a koi and with goldfish. And we have a we had a parrot. The parrot died about a month ago, which was very sad. We do have a house cat, and uh, now recently we've added another cat. Uh, plus, we have two feral barn kitties now. Some of this stuff seems like a stretch, but when you add all that up and you go to the feed store, it turns out that you can fill the back of a, a truck with food, feeding all those animals quite easily, which is the part that I have the biggest issue with, frankly. It's the feeding them. Having them is no problem. Feeding them is another story. I thought for sure you'd mention a donkey or a mule in there somewhere. Yeah, like a pack mule. That would be, that'd be a good <laughs> idea. Help you with all your loot. Well, you know, the thing is, um, I'd like a goat um, because goats will eat, you know, almost anything. And we have got a lot of uh, blackberry bushes and things like that. So I'm kind of wondering if uh, if that's next. So uh, what are you working on nowadays? I know you, you mentioned Kings and Castles and uh, Age of Empires Online. You must or really must be extremely busy about this time. Yeah, well, um, you know, game development is is an industry kind of like, um, you know, like uh, film where you, you get closer and closer to the final um, release of something, you get really busy. Um, and uh, we, we, our industry has historically been, um, you know, very crunch oriented. Uh, we're getting better at that, I have to tell you, but there's no substitute for the kind of excitement that happens just before you launch a game. Uh, there's a lot of testing, uh, things come out of the woodwork that nobody seems to have been able to, you know, no matter how much experience you have, you can't predict it. So we're busy working away, getting ready to launch Age of Empires Online on August 16th, um, which is, you know, darn near just a couple of weeks away now. And, uh, of course, you know, we've got some other stuff going on here, too. So, it, uh, you know, it's never a dull moment at, at Gaspard Games. That's my understanding is the uh, one of the founding principles of gas powered games is you don't you, you try to stick to a regular working hours as much as possible do you, do you still adhere to that yeah when i had my first uh son you know i was acutely aware of the horror stories i heard from people that said you owe if you you know you'll you'll regret not spending that time watching them grow up so i really 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 tried to uh, avoid crunch uh, we still had crunch you know we crunch we crunch on every game but there's a difference between crunching for the last couple of months and crunching all year long, year after year. Like on Dungeon Siege 1, we started the company and we worked 
a little nor normal-ish at the beginning, and then we got cr crunching a bit, and then I took a summer where I met my wife, and I was, you know, that's what women do. That's what they distract you from work, right? <laughs> And so I was distracted, and then I turned to her and I said, "Listen, I got to get back to work on this game." And I worked for the next two and a half years, and we worked seven days a week, twelve to fourteen hours a day, to get this game, the game, the, our first game built. And you know, it, it's kind of a young man's game in a way because you you really can't do that when you have responsibilities, and we've all seen that. Uh, you know, over the years, you know the the famous EA widow story, you know, or all of that where we all grew up as an industry and we tried to take those, the, the, the types of, um, the, you know, the, the, the way we used to work into our thirties and forties and it started to break. So we had to hit the reset button. And for me, I know this is a long winded answer. Um, for me, when I had my boy, I was like, you know, I'm going to try to work a normal week, um, and try to really be, do, you know, really look at the schedule and do a proper job managing the process so I can avoid it. Uh, it hasn't gone quite that smoothly, but it's been a big improvement. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, your history. I'm sort of, I wasn't able to find too much about how you got started. I know uh, about your first game was a Hardball 2, right, in 89, but how did you get there? I mean, did you uh, study computer programming at school or from books? Well, you know, it's, fu it's funny. I have, since we're on video, um, I actually have a lot of my early computer stuff in this office. Um, I've got my original TRS-80 in a box just over here. Uh, it was in the garage. And, you know, electronics don't store well in the garage. They'll get all corroded, and, 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 and uh, so basically it'll never work again. So I brought it into the office to try to make sure it, it doesn't decay anymore. Uh, I've got a book here I'll just grab. This is one of the first... This is one of the first books I ever bought. I've, I've, I've had it in a few different, uh, I've used it in a few different videos. Um, this is a book uh, you can see here. It says uh, how, to, how to program the Z80. I was, I was, I'm born in Canada, so I call that the Z80. Now it's, of course, the Z80. Um, this book is assembly code. Now, here, here's just a random page out of the book, okay? Now, I was 14 years old when I bought this book, and i got to tell you something. Uh, I didn't understand a damn thing in it. I was like, this is really intense. And uh, there, it's, it's not even immediately evident how you go from what's written in this book to making a video game. It's like, well, these are mnemonics, according to the book. And I, did, I didn't even know what an assembler was. But I muddled through that when I was 14, 15, 16. And I did a bunch of, uh, you know, hand-coded Z80 uh, assembly games on my TRS-80 uh, necessary so that you could get a frame rate. If you were coding it in basic, uh, the stuff would move around so slowly it was essentially useless. Um, nothing cool or good was ever done in basic. <laughs> That's not entirely true. There were some stock market games I, I had that were actually really fun, but they weren't graphically oriented, right, where a simulation or a frame rate mattered. But anyways, long story short, um, uh, I battled my way through that and learned all that and got my first job professionally when I was 21. And when I walked into the, the interview and I said, look, you know, here's my history. You know, I've written hand optimized Z80 code on a Terrace 80. Uh, and then I did the same again on a PC. A friend of mine had an IBM PC and I borrowed it and I learned 8088. And did the same thing and I was writing a 3D editor program that I was able to show them in, in 3D. Uh, pardon me, in assembly, which is kind of dumb. You know, really, it should have been, I should have written it in C. Um, they were impressed enough to give me my shot at the job. And then, of course, when I got the job, I was doing Hardball 2, and I was writing it entirely in C, um, which I actually technically didn't know. I had to, I sort of, I sort of lied in the interview, and I said, yeah, I know C, when I really didn't know it. And then I went off for a week, and I learned it quick before I started the job. Uh, and I managed to bullshit my way through it. Which is, uh, I mean, get, you know, if you're going to get anywhere in life, you got to told a story. <laughs> At least, you know, bullshitted your way into something. I'm guessing you're some sort of a prodigy with mathematics. A, a brain you know, with... uh, that's very nice of you to uh, imagine that. I was, um, I think I'm really stubborn. I think that's really the, uh, there's a few things, you know, we think of uh, these days, we talk about people having superpowers. What's your superpower? I think my superpower was 
I was very focused and very stubborn. Uh, math, I've never been great with math, like uh, like calculus and some of that advanced stuff. But I'll tell you what, as soon as I figured out that you needed to know trigonometry and know how to um, uh, to, know, to to spin things in 3D, you know, geometry and trig, I learned that stuff right away so I could start rotating things and, 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 and doing all of that. That was, you know, uh, that was why I learned math. I didn't learn math because I thought it was, you know, might be useful one day. What kind of games were you playing back then? I, I noticed you were a big fan of Wizardry. Are you still a fan of that? Uh, did you play Wizardry on the TRS-80? I don't even know. If, did they even have a version for that? Well, you know, it's funny. Over the years, uh, people ask me that question. You know, what did you play? What were your favorites? I think it's really mean to pick a favorite because, gosh, I played everything. I mean, I started in the arcades right in the late... 70s, you know, I was playing the asteroids and space invaders, and uh, you know, the, the, all of that kind of thing. Then, then the uh, then the the Sears Pong, you know, and then there was, you know, uh, uh, my mom bought us uh, as kids an Intellivision, and I was crazy for that. One of my favorite games, um, Utopia, uh, was just awesome. Meanwhile, in the arcades, the arcades were get, machines were getting more sophisticated, and games like um, uh, Sinistar. Uh, Robotron and uh, the Defender Stargate stuff. In fact, I have. I don't know if you can see it here, but I've got uh, I've got some coin op games right in my office. I know this is making me seem very eccentric, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm really not. I'm really not that eccentric, really. Really, I don't want you to think that. Excuse me while I have some of my Izzy. <laughs> but what seriously, are those arcade machines back there. Those are that's a uh, Sinistar. Assault, which Assault was awesome because it was one of the first games to, you know, rotate a bitmap on the screen, um, and then uh, the other one's Robotron. Uh, I mean, I've got fa I've got way more favorites than that. This is just what I managed to stumble across, and what you know. Let's not forget pinball. Pinball was awesome, right? And uh, I played. Uh, I, I actually managed to get my hands on a Black Knight 2000, and I had it in my house. When you have a pinball machine in your house, you get so good. It's scary, right? Like you can just do anything with it. You know how much it takes to tilt it, and you can just get you can play it forever. You have to quit and walk away because you're just like racking up, racking up such a crazy score. I sold that, and I regret having sold my Black Knight 2000. Never sell your stuff. Keep it forever. They can break it up into bits and throw it in your casket, so you can take it with you. That's what I say. Anyway, um, sorry, I was rambling. I got a little carried away. What did you did you just uh, first time you played a game you said oh my god this is what I want to do for a career or did, did it take a while for you to come to that realization? No, it did not take me it took me ten seconds. I mean I'm standing in an arcade and the guy is fixing you know one of the many machines and he's got the back opened on it and there's you know wires and circuitry and that smell of burning electronics in the air and I'm like I have got to do this. But, I mean, I was born out in Surrey, British Columbia. And if you were in Surrey in the 1970s, you, will, you would think that the rest of the world is everywhere but where you are. You know, like everything interesting is happening someplace else. There's nothing going on in Surrey. In fact, I'm not even so sure there's anything going on there right now. Um, there's a, it sounds actually kind of mean, but I mean, in terms of video games, you know what I mean? I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a single video game company in Surrey. So it wasn't like I was going to get a, a chance to uh, get into the business unless I moved. So I, you know, distinctive software was, it was where the job was, uh, my first job. And that was in Burnaby founded by, uh, Don Matrick and Jeff Sember, which was, uh, one of these guys, I mean, they had to be one of the first video game companies in North America. I mean, pardon me, in Canada. Uh, there might have been a company in, on the East Coast. But it was, uh, it was a pretty rare, um, rare thing to have a video game company back then. And I got very, very lucky. I mean, you, you, you cannot discount luck, pure luck that I found this ad in a newspaper in the Vancouver Sun, this tiny, tiny 
excuse me, this tiny little ad in the, you know, there's the career opportunities, and these big giant ads. Well, this was the tiny classifieds, right? And I mean, what possessed me to open the newspaper and to go searching through it and find this tiny, tiny little ad? I mean, like a needle in a haystack. And I answered this ad and they were recruiting this company in Vancouver was hired to recruit for distinctive software to find people. And they didn't want to say, you know, here's a video game company looking for people because they'd have a lineup of people down the, a mile down the road and they wouldn't find they like, basically they're looking for young computer geeks who who love video games and could sit and write you know tight code you know it's i don't want to sound like a, you know tighten the what is it i got to tighten the graphics in level three uh, you know, i mean that was kind of it right it's like can you, can you write tight video game code uh, so that was the uh, thing, and I actually, you know, I'm looking back. I think my code was pretty loose. <laughs> I don't think I was very good. I think I learned everything I needed to know, you know, really on the job from the incredible, the incredible people that uh, that worked there. Um, but uh, the the path from being 14 and getting my first computer to getting a job was was interesting, but was fraught with much peril and randomness and luck. Well, I noticed that uh, Hardball 2 actually won the Software Publishers Award uh, for the best sports game of the year. <laughs> and that must have been really impressive or exciting um, for you. First time actually, in that. You know, it's funny. Um, back then, uh, everything that Distinctive Software was doing was um, attracting some kind of crazy attention. Test Drive was uh, super successful. I believe it went double platinum, meaning a million units. Um, and so... This is going to sound really odd. So when Hardball 2 won that SPA award, um, it was like kind of disappointing because the sales weren't anywhere near what the other games were. Um, <laughs> they have a game, you know, it sold maybe 100,000 units instead of a million. So it was kind of like, oh, I kind of screwed up. But what I've learned in this industry is, is that, um, you know, the first game was for the Commodore 64, which had a completely different kind of, um, gamer, installed base, what do you call it? Different kind of demographic. And the PC wasn't really a baseball gamer's market. And it was for the, it was for the PC. So, you know, um, it was kind of time and place. And, and to be quite honest, uh, maybe I can be honest about this now, is that baseball wasn't really my, my game. My, my, it wasn't the game I dreamed of making. You know, I, w I was more into, you know, total annihilation style gaming. You know, I wanted tanks and planes and bombs and, you know, explosions, right? I, that was kind of who I was. I was a very over-the-top, dramatic, explosive kind of guy. And to make a baseball game, you know, this really meticulous, plotting game. I mean, if you know baseball, maybe you love baseball, right? I mean, you can go to a baseball game and maybe something happens. Maybe nothing happens. <laughs> You go, wow, yeah, baseball. <laughs> so, so I know it's the American pastime, right? I got to be careful. <laughs> um, but the fact is, is that, you know, I took the job and I did the best I could with it, but I think it could have done better if I was a baseball nut. And you can infuse that passion and energy um, into the into what you're doing, which is what I did on Total Annihilation. I mean, it just came through in every part of the game. Uh, but when you're doing uh, something that you're kind of doing it just because you don't want the job, uh, you don't quite, you don't quite accomplish that. Is that also the case with 4D boxing? Um, you know, uh, I, I thought 4D boxing, I was a little more into it um, because it was 3D. And I was always a big fan of 3D. I love 3D. 3D anything. You know, I'd buy every single game. We had a little store called Egghead Software up in Burnaby there, and I think I bought every game in the store. And if it was 3D, then it was it was uh, it was an in. You know, it was a you know it was it was done. But um, I actually you know um, didn't work on the boxing. This is going to kill you, right? Like I didn't work on the boxing part of the boxing. Um, I worked on everything but the boxing. It was like I, I worked on the front end. I worked on the, 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 the code for the leaderboard, for the ranking system, the, the training system, all the, all the stuff in the control room stuff. So I, I worked on Jay McDonald was the one. Um, 
he was the engineer. The other guy, it was one of the first games I ever partnered with somebody. He actually wrote the code for the actual, you know, the boxing, hitting and colliding and developed, uh, he developed this amazing um, motion capture system. Uh, I was there, you know, I mean, I threw my two cents in, we, we collaborated, we talked, but uh, in all fairness, that was really his his accomplishment. And um, and neither of us came up with uh, the idea for the game. I mean, the idea for the game was uh, was Don and and um, and uh, and the other management there. They they were pretty excited about this boxing game, and we said, "Okay, sure, we'll 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 build it." And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of this interview. We've got a lot to cover. Haven't even uh, started talking about Total Annihilation and Dungeon Siege yet, so stay tuned for that. I also want to give you a heads up. I've started to produce a weekly audio podcast. It's uh, just a monologue uh, form at the moment, just me uh, talking about games and news and stuff. Uh, you can check that out at armchairarcade.com. So if you... I want more than just Matt Chat. Head over to Armchair Arcade and check those uh, podcasts out. Should have another one up uh, next week. And, and as always, I want to thank everyone who has been donating and supporting uh, this show. It means a whole lot to me, guys. Uh, if you like the show now, you will love it if you help support it. So please keep those donations coming in. And finally, I want to leave you with a quotation, this time from a famous boxer. See if you can guess who it is. It isn't the mountain ahead that wears you down. It's the pebble in your shoe. <laughs> and that, of course, was Mr. Muhammad Ali. See you guys next week. What are children? The little ones look like you. They just go on the way you're going, you'll find out.